sorry I can't see you. I'm used, usually used to giving talks be, uh, before live audiences, and it's a big difference talking to a blank screen that uh, doesn't do anything. But I will do my best to um, to talk about uh, the Kongsberg silver mines and the silvers that come out of Kongsberg. It's going to be a slightly different kind of a talk than you've heard from me before. It'd be partly technical and partly personal. So why don't we go to the uh, the first slide. And by the way, Brian, there'll be a couple of times when I'm going to ask you to switch back to me where I want to show something. So just be prepared for that, okay? So let's go to the slides. All right, so we're going to talk about the Silvers of Kongsberg. And it's part of a longer discussion on what we call the face center cubic metals, metals, the FCC metals. And there's a reason that I'm talking about the FCC metals, of which silver is, of course, an important uh, component. Uh, but I'm going to start off with iron. This is an iron meteorite that is face center cubic. And then actually in this particular meteorite, you can see the what's called the 111 face, the uh, close packed hexagonal face of the iron. It's a meteorite that broke apart in the atmosphere and uh, shattered along these particular planes, giving the appearance of the crystal structure. And later on, I'm going to show you that exact specimen. I have it in my hand here. And then you go on and you see the next specimen of uh, copper. Copper is another face center cubic material. And you see underneath them the atomic numbers of these particular elements, which is quite important when we uh, talk about silver. So there is copper, a little bit heavier than iron. Then a considerably heavier than iron it comes silver. There's a silver specimen, a fairly famous Kongsberg silver specimen um, that rivals all that Peter has shown you, the silvers of Mexico. Um, but we won't get into the comparison of um, whose better silvers they are. Silvers are just beautiful specimens wherever they come from. Then, of course, you go down farther in the atomic uh, table, you come down to gold, which is much, much heavier than all the others. And again, there are significant ramifications between these different formations, uh, even though they all share the exact same atomic structures, which is I consider one of those miracles of nature that despite hugely different formation conditions, the materials themselves have very, very similar and parallel properties. And that is what we're going to talk about for the rest of the talk. Now, why am I going to talk about Kongsberg specifically? And the main reason is because of its location. There's a scientific reason why Kongsberg is important. And then there's a personal reason why Kongsberg is important. Uh, its importance is determined main, mainly by its economic contribution to the wealth of Norway and to the wealth of the world, as well as mineralogical interests, such as Peter was discussing about Mexico. There are similar kinds of uh, geological formations uh, and mineral species that have come out of Kongsberg, which makes it an important mineralogical uh, source. On the next slide, I really talk why Kongsberg and the reason for Kongsberg is shown in this wonderful silver specimen that is in the Kongsberg Museum in Kongsberg. So that's really why we talk about Kongsberg at this, this type of a conference. And we were talking about the economics, such as Peter talks about with his silver mining. You might not talk about Kongsberg the same way, but in terms of silver specimens, Kongsberg is unparalleled. The next slide, I want to just go into what, the way this talk is going to be slightly different from other talks. I'm going to talk about factual things, things that are scientific in content, historical in content, proven to be factual, uh, reproducible, things that you can evidence on your own. And I'm also going to talk about a personal story, which is why am I here? Why am I talking about Kongsberg? Because there's a a very specific reason why that has come about. So I'm going to talk about these two parallel universes, and then I'm going to use a bridge analogy. The bridge goes from the past to the future, and you're traveling along this bridge, and we're here today. Tomorrow is the future. Yesterday was the past. A thousand years ago was the past. And, of course, museums have existed for a long time in order to commemorate the past by providing artifacts, historical objects, exhibits, education, lectures about the past, how things have happened. 
And of course, one of the things that has a purpose of a museum is to look into the future, which is what's going to happen in the future? What does the past tell us about the future? How do we do things in the future that we have learned lessons from, from the past so we can do things better? So crossing over this bridge is a very important part of human, human beings, human civilization, human society. And that is why there are so many museums throughout the world, whether they look at music, the music uh, museum in uh, Phoenix, uh, art, uh, famous art museums around the world, or the mineralogical museums such as Harvard, Arizona Museum, uh, the Rice Museum up in the Northwest, uh, the Smithsonian, uh, Houston, uh, the museum in uh, Lebanon that Peter referred to. So museums are important. I'll come back to that at the end of the talk. Going back to this business of cubic crystals, here are the three forms of cubes. And again, to me, it is modern miraculous mathematics that says that, you know, out of all the ways that atoms can rearrange themselves in terms of the cubic system, there are just three. They're either simple cubic, where you have the atoms at the corners of the cube, a body-centered cubic, where you have an atom at the center of the body of the cube, or the face-centered cubic, which is where you put an atom in the face, a center of each face of the cube. And these are the three cubic forms. And it turns out that almost all, I would say just about all the minerals in the world that have ever been found naturally in terms of metallic elemental metals are face-centered cubic. I don't know of any body-centered cubic metals. And I certainly don't know of any simple cubic uh, metals that have been found uh, naturally. So we're going to focus on that bottom one, the face-centered cubic. Uh, crystal lattice for a few minutes. This is a face-centered unit cell, and I use the term unit cell to mean something quite specific. That is the representation mathematically of how you can do things with calculations that make it easier to figure out what the structure is. So using cubes as elemental uh, cells is very easy because you have three axes at right angles to each other, and the three axes are of equal length, so you have a cube, and you can do all kinds of things with that. And it makes the calculations of the angles very easy because 90 degrees is a very simple angle to work on. But in terms of what is the real atomistic structure, you can see that there are actually four atoms in the cell. There are eight atoms at the corners of the cube, shared by eight surrounding cubes. So there's one eighth of an atom in each of those, and there's eight of them, so that's one atom. And there are six face-centered atoms sharing neighbors with two things. So half of six is three, three plus one is four. You get four atoms per unit cell of a um, face-centered cubic material. But the actual structure of a face-centered cubic material is rhombohedral. And you can see the rhombohedral cell, which is called the primitive cell. This is the fundamental building block of face-centered cubic materials. And you can see where the ROMs are, where it goes from a corner to the center of the three faces, then up to the opposite corner. And it turns out in this case, there is but one atom per cell. And that is what scientists would use in really looking at the structure of materials, because the primitive cell is much more fundamental than structure than the mathematical satisf satisfaction you get out of using 90 degree angles as you would in a, uh, a cubic material. So a lot of people will use the cubes as the, prim as the uh, unit cell, but in reality, the rhombohedral cell is the uh, fundamental uh, uh, cell of a, a face under cubic material. And of course, rhombohedral cells are very common to other things, in particular, hexagonal materials. So if you look at the face center cubic from a different way, if you just look down at the what's called the 111 face, you find out it's what's called a closed pack face. You just stack the atoms, as close together as you can, you get this figure up in the upper left. Now, when you look at that, you can see that there are the black interstices between these, and there are actually two different positions. There's one called B. If the atom is at A, then there's a position called B, and a different position called C. So you can stack the atoms up by putting an A level, and then a B level, and then another A level on top of it, and then another B level. Or you can stack them an A, then a B, then a C, then an A, then a B, then a C, and you get fundamentally different crystals. 
So we're going to look at that for one moment because, again, it is important when we start talking about silver in particular. So if we look at it from the side, you can see the ABC, ABC, ABC. That is what forms cubic crystals. That geometry is one where the satisfaction of the laws of mathematics and the angles and all that are com compatible with cubic symmetry. If you were to stack the animals of A, B, A, B, A, B, you get hexagonal symmetry, which is representative of all the hexagonal crystals that you know of, barrel and quartz and all those kinds of things. But the main thing about the face-centered cubic, the one on the left, the A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, is that all those planes can slip against each other very easily, which in particular means that those materials are very ductile. <coughs> all face on cubic materials exhibit this structure. And as you know, if you look at either man-made metals such as aluminum or extracted, which is face on cubic, and you look at copper and gold and platinum and silver, and all the other face center cubic metals, they are all ductile, they are all easily deformed, which really contributes to why these materials are so important. So face center cubic materials, you always exhibit this metallic luster. You know that it's a metal. You don't have to sit there and describe it and say, it doesn't look like a metal. Yes, it's got a metallic luster. All of them are excellent conductors of heat. All of them are excellent conductors of electricity. All of them are highly malleable and ductile. And as Peter pointed out in the last talk, the silver and copper and iron and gold are plentiful and they are easy to extract from ore bodies. None of them are really difficult to come about. In the irons, you have the big iron ranges, such so as the Lake Superior area. You have the copper mines up in, um, in Nevada, Arizona, Michigan. You have the silver mines in Mexico, Norway, Germany. Uh, you have uh, the gold mines of California and the rest of the world and South Africa and so forth. So these have enabled civilization to exist. The fact that they conduct heat, they conduct electricity, they are ductile and malleable, they are plentiful. Uh, these are really important. Look at copper. Copper is used for coinage. It's plentiful. doesn't rust very much. It corrodes a bit, but it's not too bad. But it's valuable. It can be made into transmission wires, and all the transmission wires in the world that conduct electricity throughout the world are made of copper because of the ductility. Unparalleled in its ability to do this simply because it's so plentiful, easy to extract, and a high conductor of electricity. Gold. Gold is, uh, in addition, has another uh, attribute, which is, is highly non-corrosive, so it lasts a long time. Therefore, it's remarkable for jewelry and for coinage. And it also, as you can see, makes very, very beautiful specimens. Um, gold is just one of those that has attracted people uh, throughout, throughout the ages. Silver, the same thing, highly malleable, metallic luster comes out, make it into coins, it's plentiful, make it into wonderful artifacts such as the silver cups, and it is a beautiful, beautiful material. So there's a lot of commonality between these three. I'm not showing the iron because the iron is in a slightly different category, mainly used for structural elements, very strong strength, but you can deform it, make it into a, an iron girder, harden it so that it doesn't really bend after that. And you can make... Uh, both hard things as well as ductile things out of iron, which is why iron is so important, as well as its magnetic, uh, magnetic properties. But you go back to the history of sulfur and say, where did all this stuff come from in the first place? And now you find out some very interesting differences between iron, copper, gold, silver. Came from the Big Bang, the origin of the universe, which we won't get into how that occurred, but it occurred universe expanded and started to cool down as it expanded and formed stars. And the stars sometimes exploded, giving rise to interstellar debris. And that interstellar debris started to accumulate and formed into planets. 
and the planets then heated up and uh, got molten and cooled down. They formed ore bodies, and the ore bodies allowed you and me to extract these metals from the ore bodies. So that is, in one slide, the history of, of all the elements, in particular of, of silver. And these slides, by the way, come, a lot of them, uh, come with the courtesy of Terry Wallace, who's an expert on silver. And of course, he and Peter and others have written a number of papers about silver, especially in the um, aftermath of the silver wire uh, specimens, the unnatural, artificially grown uh, silver wire specimen that appeared a number of years ago and the study of these things. So these are an no, interest in the history of silver. But if we look at it from a cosmic point of view on the left, you have, uh, oh, essentially a blowing up of a supernova, which puts out all kinds of debris and stuff. You get the bang, big bang, get the stars from, you get the supernova, you get the uh, accumulation of debris, you get the galaxies, you get all that stuff happening. And it's sort of a historical thing going back roughly 13 and a half billion years uh, to the formation of the solar system about 5 billion years ago uh, to the extraction of the metals, which is a few thousand years. So a microcosm in the history of the universe. But the big differences are these. In the sun, you have fusion going on and fusion creates a certain amount of energy. The fusion energy is only sufficient to create the metals up to iron. So iron is formed in the sun. It is formed by the fusion of hydrogen to helium and helium to boron, and lithium and to sodium and oxygen up to iron. And then the system runs up because of insufficient energy to go beyond iron. So where does the uh, copper and all the other stuff come from? It comes from the things like the supernova. Some star gets so hot and so big and they collapse on themselves in the gigantic explosion. That explosion is sufficient to create enough energy to drive some of these atoms together to create the heavier elements. And then you form copper and silver out of the supernova. So copper and silver are formed in this kind of environment, but not gold. And this is where the stuff that Sari Wallace has been involved in is that you have to have special kinds of super high energy conditions in order to form the heavy elements like gold and platinum. And those they theorize are come from neutron star collisions. So you have these big explosions, the supernova that create neutron stars and neutron stars come near each other, collide. And when they collide, they come up with gigantic explosions that outshine the supernova and you get the formation of the, the super heavy elements. Now in the supernova on the left, you see you get a ring sort of or a sphere of material that is put out. And that's all this debris, but it usually collapses in sort of a disk. In the case of the neutron stars, you get a sort of a shaft of material being thrown out. So the formation of the gold is in these shafts of material. Gold is less densely populated through the universe. And therefore you find, generally speaking, less gold, more silver, more of the lighter elements because supernova are more common and they get the debris into places where it is more easily accumulated. So you start this accumulation that accumulates into a disk around the star, it condenses, it gets cooler. And then when it forms the planet, the planets heat up because there's a lot of radioactive elements in there and there's a lot of meteoric or collisions between things. The planets heat up and they become molten. And as they become molten, the materials inside, the molten materials tend to segregate. Um, like you've seen oil and water segregate. If you put them together, they don't mix well. You shake them, they will mix, and then they will settle out. And that's the same thing that happens in the earth. But it turns out that for the most part, gold has an affinity for iron. And iron is at the center of the core of the earth. And therefore, it is speculated that most of the gold that has been formed by these neutron star collision is really formed and is contained within the core of the earth. And that's where if you want to go gold mining, you go down and dig into the core. Silver, copper, and so forth, they've accumulated from the um, uh, 
supernova types of things. They are materials that are segregate during the cooling of the earth, but they come up at the surface and therefore you have these large deposits of segregated materials, which forms the large bodies of iron ore, large bodies of copper deposits, large bodies of other deposits. Now the gold, in order to be found, usually comes up near places where the earth is ruptured, a fault, such as you know, in California, the gold area is because of the San Andreas or the other earth faults, where parts of the earth are sublime underneath the other, parts of it are shot up, there are magmas, bringing up materials from deep down, they show up in these areas and you get those kinds of deposits. Silver is a little bit different, it is more near the surface, Therefore, you can accumulate and it can do both of this weathering conditions, oxidation processes uh, that Peter has uh, talked about. And you get a lot of surface deposits of silver and therefore the surface deposits of silver are more widespread and they turn out tons and tons and tons of silver versus uh, not so much gold. So the origin of these materials is vastly different. Iron is formed by the sun, copper and silver are formed by supernova, Gold is formed by the collision of neutron stars. And again, it's remarkable to me two things. One, that they form into with these face center cubic materials that are exactly the same, same similar properties. And number two, that they obey all the mathematical laws that are independently derived. And the fact that nature follows the mathematics, that mathematics aptly describes nature down to 20 decimal points, is to me one of these great miracles of. Uh, of the planet that we live in, and which propelled me to become a scientist. Well, one of those deposits happened to be in that portion of the globe that is circled up above called Norway, and in the part of the Norway called Kongsberg, and there you can see a map of where Kongsberg is. That's the Kongsberg silver deposits. Kongsberg, Norway. These are three pictures of the main area of the uh, mine entrance uh, back from the 18th century to the 19th century to the 20th century. And it went from the horse and buggy to the mule trains to the electric railroad to bring people in. And now, of course, they've had guided tours of this thing. But this is the same building that was built uh, several hundred years ago. The Kongsberg Museum opened in 1930. It was open to the public, but that was just at the start of World War II. Norway was invaded in uh, 1940. So the museum actually opened to the public in 1945 after World War II. But it mined silver from 1623 to about 1958. Uh, perhaps a million, a million, three hundred thousand kilo of silver extended. Peter's talking about more silver, and I'm sure there's going to be more, but this is really quite a bit of silver with 4,000 people. Kongsberg was at the time one of the largest cities in Norway and it has you know, 30, 40,000 types of, um, of, of visitors every year. And the deepest parts go well below 1,000 meters below sea level. It has been unique in the amount of silver and the presence and perfection of the wire silver samples, which is what made Kongsberg the famous place it is. Here's the references which you can uh, look up later or send me a message if you want. There are uh, several very, very good references to the uh, mining of silver in the uh, Kongsberg. Two of them are listed uh, uh, below. The next slide shows the uh, old Kongsberg works. And talk to, I'm not going to talk like Peter did about the geology and the morphology and all that, other than to mention that the geology of silver in Kongsberg is particular because it comes out at the intersection of two kinds of uh, geological formations and the miners learned to follow these two geological formations or where they intersected, you find these large pockets of uh, silver wires. So it's a kind of a unique geology. And then you have the phenomenon of wire growth. It turns out when I was at uh, Fairchild, uh, before I went to Intel, uh, we studied aluminum, another face uh, cubic metal, that was giving problems because it was a conductor of electricity used in the integrated circuits. And it was showing the movement of aluminum atoms propelled by electric current. And these things led to buildup of aluminum in some places you didn't want it, and voids in aluminum in places you didn't want it, which led to open circuits or short circuits in the semiconductor device, phenomenon called electromigration. 
So it's a movement of silver ion due to electric forces. And that is primarily what is responsible for the growth of the silver wires. You have two things going on. You have a pressure difference because the density of the starting material, such as a canthite or whatever, is different from that of silver. So you have a pressure difference. And once the pressure builds up, you start growing wires. But the silver migrates easily due to these electrical forces because silver has a particular kind of a conduction. And the silver ions are easily migratable under this electric field. So you grow these wonderful silver wires. And that is fairly unique. If you look at the gold wires, and we'll talk about it uh, shortly uh, when I talk about some of the specimens, gold wires are formed under a, a different set of conditions. So the wire growth is fairly easy, and people have been doing the replication of silver wires to the conservation of mineral dealers who had to deal with specimens that looked exactly like natural specimens but were artificially grown. This is the interior of the museum in Kongsberg as it now stands, a beautiful, wonderful, well-kept museum. But now that tells me about my path, the second bridge. From my past, where I came from, and why I'm interested in geology and crystal growth, and why I chose that as my, uh, my own personal future, comes from the fact that my father was born in a town called Newtod, in the arrow on the left, which is 30 kilometers away from Kongsberg, Norway. And you can see how close they are because you can see Oslo, the capital of Norway, is in the upper right. So my father grew up near the Kongsberg mine. He left when he was a kid to join, live in Oslo with his parents. And then the set of circumstances happened which caused me to be where I am. My father was born there. His younger brother, Sigmund, became a childhood friend of a man named Gunnar Henningsmoen. Gunnar Henningsmoen was the head of the geology museum in Oslo. And after the war, after the, all the horrors of World War II, my father took me as a child back to Norway where I met my uncle's good friend, Gunnar Henningsmoen. And he took me out rock collecting and that changed my life because, because of him, uh, I became interested, more interested in the science. My uncle Sigmund, was a scientist and a technologist. My father was an insurance salesman. Uh, I wasn't in for insurance. Sigmund in involved me in science and technology. Gunnar involved me in the specific science of geology and crystal collecting. I became a crystal co collector and that never stopped from 1949. So I've been collecting since, you know, 73 or whatever, how many years. He gave me my first specimen of Kongsberg silver back in 19... 49, I still have it. Um, I'm happy to say it was worth 50 cents then, and it is probably worth 75 cents now. Wasn't a very good specimen, but it got me involved in the Collinsburg mines. It's one of the first specimens I ever owned. This is uh, from my father's point of view. He was a member of the King's Royal Guard in 1926, migrated to the United States soon after, but there's a picture of my father as he was in the King's Guard. But he always had this strong affinity for Norway, and I grew up believing that Norway was my second home. So when we went there in 1949, it just became the place with the remaining relatives after the Holocaust, came very close to all of them, and particularly close to uh, the geologist Gunnar Henning's there's me as a child, I'm uh, the little one on the left-hand picture that's taken at the uh, what's called Camp Little Norway in Toronto, where my uncle Sigmund, after he escaped from Norway, joined the Royal Norwegian Air Force. On the right is his friend Gunnar Henningsmoen, and Gunnar was head of the Geology Museum in Oslo. And the first thing I remember of going into that museum when Gunnar took me there was that Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, skull casting, which I always remembered as being the thing that Wow, I didn't know such things like that existed. Uh, just as an aside, my wife was got interested. She never had the passion I did, but here she is standing on a big thing in a Norwegian calcite mine a number of years later. I just thought I would add that for the heck of it. There I am with Fred Simon Nordstrom. Now, um, Brian, can you switch back to me for a moment? Can you see this little thing here? This is something that Fred gave me uh, when I went to Norway to pick up the silver specimen. 
that one of the miners who was wanting to sell, and he had contacted Fred, and Fred had contacted me. This is from the Kongsberg mine made out of Kongsberg silver. And this is actually the mold, the original pattern that they use for the Kongsberg Museum uh, designation, the hammer and so forth. And I was very proud to get this, but that was because I was, you know, kind of helpful to Fred at the time and to helpful to the museum and tried to publicize the Kongsberg uh, story and my, my own ties to Kongsberg to my father. And I'm just very proud to uh, have this. While it's still on me, I want to show you that specimen of a uh, of meteorite that I was talking about. This is the meteorite, and you can see the wonderful octagonal, octahedral specimen. It's rare that you get a meteorite that has come out this way, but it's a very large piece of meteorite, and it has, for me, the really interesting surfaces, like this uh, triangular 111 face. Uh, the face that shows the uh, face under cubic structure. And of course, it shows a little bit of melt pattern because it broke up in the atmosphere. It was still pretty hot when it came down. But I love this kind of specimen. Okay, back to the uh, display, back to the talk. All right, so we can go and talk about the silver specimens. I became interested as a result of Gunnar's, uh, Gunnar Henningsbone's uh, involvement in me. We went out rat collecting many times together. And um, I had that first piece of silver, but I was never able to afford the really good silvers until I started working long after I graduated from college. And then I started picking up one. One of the first ones I picked up this is this one uh, from uh, Keith Proctor. He had this specimen, and it's a pretty famous wire silver from uh, Kongsberg. And then I got this next one, and I said, boy, you know, I may as well start collecting silver as well as the gemstones, which I started to uh, uh, specialize in single crystal gemstone because I'm, I love crystals. I'm brought up in crystals. I've always thought of crystal structure, the use in semiconductor industry, their use in technology, always fascinated me. But I got really interested in picking up the silver, so I started collecting them. And then I got this one that Bob Jones had owned and he gave it to his son, Evan. Evan traded it to Wayne Thompson. I got it from Wayne Thompson. And it is just an absolutely superb piece of uh, warrior silver. The piece on the right is another piece that I got when I got a trade. And there's an interesting story behind that one. I got it. Uh, and I think that came from, if I remember, Stu Walensky. And I had it on the floor in our house in, in Phoenix. And I was considering trading a really nice set of specimens for it. And Roz walked into the room and looked at the silver and said, you're not trading that. You are never going to let that one go, the silver. Turns out, that although my wife is an artist in ceramics and really loves color, she loves Kongsberg silvers. So this one never is going to leave the house. It's just a beautiful, beautiful, large piece of uh, Kongsberg silver. Here's my Kongsberg silver along with the Harvard uh, horn. And they both have great degree of similarity of wires. They are elongated, they have striations, but gold is a very heavy element in comparison to silver, therefore it doesn't migrate as well under an electric field as does the silver. So there's a different mechanism for the gold, which is mainly pressure. You know, there's pressure involved in the silver because of the density difference between the starting material and the silver. And the gold is predominantly, I think, pressure driven to drive in these uh, crystals. But again, the similarity between a material formed by a neutron star collision and a material formed by a supernova collision, uh, it's remarkable, the structure and the fact that they are both these face-centered cubic structures. I, I just find that fascinating. It, it's my own personal thing. Some more of the silvers. This is one, the one on the left I got from Richie Cosner. The one on the right is the one I went back to Norway for uh, that I showed you the picture with uh, Fred Steiner uh, is with, to get this specimen. You see the little peg on the bottom. And that's because during the early years in the 1950s, they were selling specimens and they were sort of screwed into little metal, uh, wooden blocks. And that is the screw that was used to attach this silver specimen to a metal block. And at that time, if I had known it, silver was selling for spot price and I could have bought these specimens for spot because I was there in 1949. Um, 
when I went back to this one in about 2008, it was slightly more expensive. Another specimen that I uh, like because it's different is the one I got from uh, Eric Asselborn. It's the one on the left. And uh, the fact that you get other, cube, other forms of crystallization, such as the cubes, is the one on the right I got from uh, uh, Mike Bergman uh, a number of years ago. So I just decided to keep on adding to the silver collection. One on the left is from Rob Levinsky, and I believe this belonged to the King Gustav of Sweden at one time. The one on the right is interesting. It's not a particularly attractive silver wire or silver specimen, but it's different, so I got the thing. And then I found out that there's a relationship between that and its origin. Uh, not really, but it looks that way. Here is that silver specimen seen from another perspective. And there is the comet, whatever the name is, however it's pronounced. It's about the four kilometers across and it's uh, in space about, I don't know how many millions of kilometers away in the concrete. But I looked at them and I said, boy, there's a remarkable similarity. And maybe there's some kind of an affinity between the silver coming from space and the comet. Uh, anyway, I just get, get a kick out of these kinds of observations. That's this personal side. Other silvers that I acquired over the years, I think the one on the left is from Marcus Budil. Another one, uh, wonderful uh, wire-wrapped silver, and one I got from uh, Scott Worski not too long ago. And there are other silvers. These are from the museum itself, the silver the museum. You find wonderful specimens of silvers. And I had visited the museum in 1963, and I remember seeing wires that were eight inches in diameter and three feet long that, uh, at the time. Just incredible specimens of silver. Here's a silver twin uh, in the uh, Kongsberg Museum. Here's another wire from the Kongsberg Museum that I took a picture of when I was there. Pictures from the museum itself of the cubes and some of their wonderful, wonderful specimens with uh, various silver materials such as silver uh, Peter was talking about. Then, um, Gary Hansen gave me uh, some of his pictures that he took back in the 1950s of silver specimens. So these I took from his slides. These are specimens, many, many, the specimens are still there, but he took these pictures, uh, you know, almost what was it, 75, 80 years ago. So I just showed four of these specimens of the pictures that uh, slides he gave me. But I want to close with a comment about museums. Because this is the Kongsberg Museum, it has a lot to do with me personally. I have a great affinity for it. Uh, but museums are things that have taken up my life. They are reposit repositories of artifacts. They keep history alive for us. They are home to curious people. Why did this happen? How did this happen? When did this happen? Where did this happen? What relevance does it have to me today? And so forth. Uh, just an enormous number of questions that come out out of visits to museum. They show us what was in order to help us to find out what can be. You know, we learn how to do things in space through the Space Museum of the Smithsonian. We see the landing craft of the moon, the lunar lander. We figure out how we need to modify that in order to land on Mars or how to explore other remote places with robots and so forth. It takes the museums to help us learn. They're the training downs for people like me, scientists, engineers, educators. And in fact, I don't know of a single one of the people that I know in the mineral community uh, that has a, um, a serious interest in uh, the minerals, whether it be the academics like uh, Bob Downs or, or John Rakovin, or whether it be the uh, uh, engineers, the scientists like uh, mathematicians like Steve Smale. Um, Phil Scalise, uh, whether it be the educators, um, they all started in one of two ways, they either or both ways. They started because they went to a museum and were fascinated, or they met somebody that brought them to a museum or brought them to some place to collect and got them hooked. So it's one of those two ways. So it takes people 
the museums about are about us who we were and who we're going to be, and it takes people. I started with museums in Cleveland, the Museum of Natural History. After I came back from Norway, I uh, went to uh, Purdue University where they had a great geology department. Went to MIT and I just visited Harvard every other day and associated with Cliff Rondell, who was the uh, head of the Department of Geology at Harvard University, and. All through this time, I met the people that influenced my life, whether it be Gunnar Henningsmoen from Oslo or Dick Lonsbury at Purdue, Cliff Rondell at Harvard, Paul DeSabels, who I spent time with at the Smithsonian, Joel Barch, who I've been a friend with for many, many years from Houston, uh, George Robinson, who spent a lot of time with him with the Seaman Museum, and uh, Bob Downs, of course, at the University of Arizona Museum. So I just want to point out they are essential to a civilized society. I encourage everyone that is listening, wherever you are, if you get a chance, visit the University of Arizona, the Alfie Norville Museum, which opened. I was president of the board there for 10 years. Uh, the museum has just opened, and it is a magnificent, magnificent museum. And if you're up in the Northwest area in Oregon, come to the Rice Museum, Rice Northwest Museum of Rocks and Minerals near, uh, near Portland, because museums are important. So in summary, I want to point out that what started as a supernova explosion or a neutron star billions of years ago influences us today. I'm influenced by the fact that my body is made up of interstellar debris, that I collect rocks that are made up of atoms that were formed billions of years ago that accumulated and formed these crystals that I uh, like so much. Uh, the universe may be very, very, very large. Um, but to me, it's all personal. And that's why I became who I am, why I do what I do. Thank you. <laughs>